Hello, everybody, as you come in. Those of you who have been on Opimian virtual tastings before will know that we uh, give it a little time for people to come in. Um, it's just one minute past the hour at the moment, so uh, we'll give people a few more minutes before I introduce our, uh, introduce our esteemed guests and uh, we'll get started talking about uh, tasting climate change. We have a couple of Opimians, uh, Opimian staff members here. David Markovich is running the board for us. Thank you, David. Nice to see you. And Michael Howe, our head of growth, who uh, I'll be talking a little bit about how it's because of him that uh, we have these two uh, incredible women to talk to us today. So, oh, and Leah, how are you, Leah? Uh, Leah Pasquet is also uh, on our staff and she does our social media. So she'll be looking for all of you to be tweeting and Instagramming. Is that a word, Leah? <laughs> <laughs> they tell me at Opimian that, um, that I'm too old to be on Instagram. So they don't uh, put any of my stuff on Instagram. So. I'm more of a Facebook uh, age guy. So, so and do feel free to keep your uh, your cameras on if you like. Uh, it's always nice to see the members. And uh, I think you're gonna find this an extremely engaging talk and you're gonna be wanting to ask questions. We will ask you to ask your questions by typing them into the chat. If you haven't been on Zoom very much, there's a, a bar along the bottom where you click on the chat and that will give you the opportunity to send us a, an email. And I'll be moderator, so I'll, I'll watch for a, a suitable time in the break of uh, conversation that we can answer your questions as we go uh, forward. And if you're anything like me, you're going to have lots of questions because I, uh, I'm i learning uh, along with you today. So we're two minutes past. I usually wait till three, so we'll, we'll wait uh, one more minute before we get started. Um, and then we'll, uh, we'll solve all the problems of the world, won't we, Michelle? <laughs> so, I don't know. We'll try to give hope, yes, that's for sure. Yes, that's right. Well, and again, thank you, Opinion members, for joining us. Uh, I think that these virtual events are are one of the main reasons that we are Opinion members, right? It's it's about that conversation of wine, sharing the love of wine with our fellow uh, Opinion members. And we're lucky enough um, to, to have on the call today in, in cellar uh, 304, which you should have gotten in the mail by now. If you turn to page 11, there's a new producer in Nova Scotia, Lightfoot and Wolfville, and one of our, our um, strategic plan uh, icons from two years ago was to have more Canadian producers, and we were delighted to find Lightfoot and Wolfville. Today, we've got Rachel Lightfoot on the call, and she's one of the family and also on the management team of, uh, of Lightfoot and Wolfville, and I had said to Rachel that I was about to say Wolfville and Lightfoot, and she said I wouldn't be the only one. So, so welcome, Rachel, to the conversation. Thank you. I'm, uh, right. yeah, very excited to be here. Thanks for having us. And then through Michael Howe, our, our head of growth, uh, we've met Michelle Buffard, and Michelle is do, is uh, responsible, the founder, and and working through Tasting Climate Change, which is an organization that I will let her describe. And mm -hmm. it, it was very interesting to find out that there was a connection to uh, to Rachel. And that is that there's going to be a Tasting Climate Change Conference in Nova Scotia on April 22nd and 23rd. And that's one of the reasons we wanted to talk to, to have this conversation today is to invite you to that conference and to a dinner, a very special dinner that's being provided. And again, I'll let uh, Michelle and Rachel talk about that. So welcome to the conversation, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. And and I thought we'd get I'd get us started just by talking about that. Is that Michelle? You've been running Tasting Climate Change for for a while now, and I'd love to know how you ended up uh, meeting Rachel and how you've ended up having a, a conference in Nova Scotia. Yeah, well, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, I think this is a really important topic, and uh, we're really thrilled to to share this uh, with your members. Um, I founded Tasting Climate Change in. Uh, the first edition was in 2017. So basically what Tasting Climate Change is, is gathering the top expert in the world um, to give solution to the wine industry to adapt and mitigate climate change. So part of it is adaptation. It's happening. What can we do to adapt? The other part is how can we you know, reduce our carbon footprint? And to me, uh, this even though most of the conference I do are really targeted to wine professional, 
um, the full circle isn't there if we don't talk to the consumer, because at the end, they're the one who are going to make the decision. They have the biggest impact because you know, the bottle they choose to buy, um, it's, it's a powerful gesture that makes a big difference. And so how did I get to connect with Rachel? Well, I've known the wine for a long time. I, I'm a huge fan of what they do. And when I first started to do the conference, Tasting Climate Change, which took place in Montreal um, multiple times, Nova Scotia was always one of the wine region that was very, very supportive of the conference uh, in many ways. And um, in 2019, when the world of wine came to Montreal for the conference, the wine we served as a welcoming um, drink was uh, the wine from Lightfoot. And a lot of people didn't even know that we made, um, well, never mind wines in Canada, uh, besides ice wine, but sparkling wine in Nova Scotia. So it was really exciting to, to show that wine to the rest of the world. And what I'm doing now is moving the conference in different parts of the world. I'm going to keep on having the conference in Montreal, but I also do mini conference in different wine regions so that we can bring expertise to a specific wine region and help them out. Um, so it was a, only a natural um, fit uh, that I would think of, of, of Rachel and, and Lightfoot and Wellville. Terrific. And, and Rachel, you, you kind of took it from there, did you, and, and started planning this with Michelle? Yeah, well, um, of course, uh, Michelle is really the the host of the event. So we've been working together and collaborating for for several months on uh, on the events with her uh, her direction. And um, what I'm so excited about, and one of the reasons why we were so eager to uh, you know kind of support this and and join along was the the concept of the mini conference being very. Um, focused and regional uh, region specific you know I think with viticulture um, it is very region specific so what is uh, true to one region um, is not true to all and uh, to find those uh, you know solutions that Michelle talked about for adaptation I think that it's really brilliant that she's come up with this concept to make it specific for the region. So topics that are really relevant um, here. So we were really excited to, uh, yeah, to, to join her and, uh, and bring this to Nova Scotia. And, and so then Michelle, you, you mentioned that the first one was in 2017. Can you talk a little bit about the, the progression, how that's, how that's changed, how we're talking about change, but but and and are you in a different place now? Um, six years on, is is there are there new things to discuss? I mean, things to discuss is never a problem. The problem is <laughs> to, to choose the topics for for those conferences because there's so much to talk about. I think the main thing that has changed is when I first started the first edition of the conference. I did. I didn't even know if people were ready to talk about this. And I know it sounds weird because now it's we talk about climate change all the time, but back, the first conference was in 2017. So I started to plan it in 2016. And I needed to find sponsorship to help me cover the costs of, of the speakers, the room and, and et cetera. And a lot of the wine regions and the producer did not want to participate because they did not want to be associated to climate change. It was very taboo. And it's it's funny to think about this now because now the same people who said I don't want to be engaged with with this are coming to me saying we need to be part of the discussion because we have no choice. So I think what's encouraging is I've seen the awareness grown so much um, in terms of the challenges. To me, I've been researching on this since 2005, so way before it became the topic of the hour. Uh, and I remember in 2005, I was thinking, why are we not talking about this? It's going to be, yes, we were, but not that much. And that's going to be the biggest trouble that we are going to have. Um, so when you're saying, is there something new? Well, everything that's happening, we kind of knew it was going to happen we just you know as human sometimes we wait to see the disaster happen or we need a big wake-up call to really see okay there's fires there's drought there's chaos 
this is true, it's happening. So I think for me, the change is, is more on the awareness of, of people. And, um, and I think now the wine industry is, is very aware that, you know, the viticulturists, people who work the land, they're the first one to notice because they, the crop, they see uh, right away the changes, the subtle changes that we as consumers might, might not see. Um, and so it, it's really important. And that's why we're doing this, this dinner also, because on the Sunday, it's an event more for the trade. People can attend, of course, if they want, but the Saturday night is a dinner. And the goal with this is really to engage the consumer because, okay, so knowing what everything can be done, what can I do when I go to the liquor store and pick a bottle of wine? And so Or order from Opimia. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> It doesn't, regardless of where you buy, what are the things that you should consider before making a decision, right? Right, absolutely. And and if I may, I'll, I'll go to you, Rachel, and and maybe we should talk about how climate change is impacting your business and and the entire Nova Scotia wine industry. Yeah, so um, it's interesting to hear Michelle talk about how, you know, support of Nova Scotia as a region was of, of the conference and of the topic. And I think that maybe part of that is because as a region, we really ultimately exist um, in a way, the modern uh, wine industry here um, as a result of uh, climate change and global warming. So even um, 30 years ago, which, you know, we are a relatively a uh, young wine region, especially um, the kind of the modern day commercial industry you could say in the last 30 years, we wouldn't have been growing some of the varieties that we're growing today or making the styles of wine that we're making today, even a few short decades ago. So, you know, my family, the Lightfoot family, that's our, our family name. Um, and uh, we've been farming in the Annapolis Valley for eight generations. We've been four generations where the vineyard is today, our, our home farm vineyard. And so we've seen firsthand those changes that um, we're talking about. And, you know, talking to my grandfather growing up and my great grandmother, um, just, you know, this, those are subtle things, but it's happening at a rate that's quite, um, it's it's quite quick. And uh, how, how it translates to wine, in a way, it's actually making it a viable region. So that, that overall trend towards warming has moved us um, from being very much on the cusp as a wine producing region and um, a region that is conducive for growing grapevines for wine. Um, to and moving us into a window of possibility and right now that window has us climatically very well suited for traditional methods sparkling wine production at a very high level so that trend is kind of moving us into a into a realm of possibility as a wine region um, the the scary part with that of course is the erratic weather events so the hurricanes being uh, where we are, uh, that is something that we do we do see every few years. This past winter, we had um, a polar vortex event. That is the most uh, recent um, sort of weather event that we're, we're dealing with here. So it's certainly something that Nova Scotia wine growers were just acutely aware of because our, like I said, our region is, um, is really shaped by um, our changing climate. Right. And, and to take that, Michelle, and, and see that on a global or even national scale, uh, it differs by province and by country, doesn't it? But but in a, in a sense, there's also similar problems. Yeah, I think that, you know, as humans, sometimes we would like it to be simple or black and white and say, OK, some of the regions will disappear because they're going to be fire and drought and no water and other regions like Nova Scotia and Quebec will make amazing wine and it'll be easy. Um, I think the challenges vary from region to region, but what they all facing is this erratic weather. Um, when you're, you know, you're not really getting, you know, for example, there are some places where they have drought. Um, it's not just drought, it's not getting the water at the right time. You know, ideally, if you're farming uh, in a, in a, you want the, the water to come mostly in the winter time so that the soil can have the reserve. And then, you know, from the time you have the fruit set till picking, you want minimal 
water but now what we're seeing is that some regions were not having any water in the in the winter time no reserve in the soil and all of a sudden there's like torrential rain um in the summer so I think regardless of the region, they are the, the challenges is really this erratic weather. I, I like to call it like the cha cha chaotic uh, climate change, right? It's the chaotic mm -hmm. climate and the increase of disease pressure, new insect appearing because insect obviously where they live is directly, it's it's linked to, to climate. So we're seeing some insect you know, from the south moving to the north because it's getting too hot. We're seeing diseases also that regions haven't seen before. So there's a lot of, of a learning curve. If you are a region who, for example, you have biodiversity and you've kind of encouraged, you know, some beneficial insect, but now you're seeing some new insect appearing or new diseases. Well, it's a lot of things to learn all of a sudden uh, for, for wine growers. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's the perfect segue into my next question. The burning question I have, Rachel, is biodynamics. I noticed that in the catalog that uh, we've got you listed as uh, organic bio. And do you want to describe a little bit about what those biodynamics are? And I did want to just pause briefly and say thank you so much for so many people taking an interest in this. It's so brilliant to see so many people on this call. And uh, and if you do have any questions that you want to ask, please ask them in the chat. And in the meantime, I've got 46 of them, so no problem. So so please go ahead, Rachel. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, so Lightfoot and Wolfo, we're, we're very proud to be uh, a certified organic as well as biodynamic uh, farm winery. Uh, so biodynamics, most folks are usually familiar with organic farming. That's something that um, you know, we see in the in the supermarket and uh, biodynamics is a tends to be a little bit uh, more rare, at least here in North America. Uh, so basically, in a nutshell, what it is, is one of the oldest, if not the oldest form of organic farming. Um, the origins are rooted back in 1924, so it's post World War One and uh, in Europe, and it was the first time that petrochemicals uh, that were left over from the war were being used as synthetic fertilizers. And the farmers were noticing, you know, this decline in soil health and in uh, crop health, crop uh, longevity. Um, and so the founder, Rudolf Steiner, gave a series of lectures that we're all about sort of returning to working in harmony with nature. And that really is the, the basis of what biodynamic, uh, the biodynamic movement today. So basically it's a global movement and it's widely regarded as one of the, the most sustainable forms of regenerative uh, organic agriculture. And um, just a few quick examples of kind of the core biodynamic philosophies. It's it's a big topic. We could kind of deep dive on that <laughs> for a while. So I will do my best to keep it succinct. Um, but basically at, at the heart, I like to explain it as it's really a philosophy um, where you're looking at your, your farm as a whole living ecosystem. So it's its own individuality. And the whole goal is to uh, enhance the, the health um, of that ecosystem and sustain it um, in, in as much of a self-sustaining loop as possible. So one of the, the things we were chatting about before, um, kind of a difference between biodynamic vineyards and organic vineyards, one, um, one common practice would be keeping livestock. So there's this whole, um, this whole uh, theme of biodiversity and soil health. So one of the things that we, we have here, um, instead of just tending the vines as a monoculture, we also are integrating livestock into our, our ecosystem. So we have cattle and pigs and sheep, and they all play a different role. Um, overall together, their manure is providing us with the fertility that goes back into the vineyard. Um, so we're, we're creating compost from uh, the livestock that live here on the site on this site so it's a, a self-sustaining loop as much as possible and the we're raising some of them for meat in our restaurant so we will actually at the dinner we will be serving some of our beautiful mangalitsa um, pork charcuterie um, and we also are of course growing vegetables and herbs here on site as well but it's um, that whole kind of uh, holistic uh, approach to uh, to viticulture and to food and um and to farming uh 
as I said, it goes a lot deeper than that. But that kind of gives you a little a little tip of the iceberg. I just I just want to say something from the outsider is that you know you've explaining you're explaining it so well because it's complicated. But what I love is that you know it is supposed to be a self sustaining philosophy. But I just have to say, not many people who are biodynamic actually have the animals on the land. And it is something that I really admire at Lightfoot is that you really embrace the full concept because there are a lot of, of biodynamic producers who will do everything required, but will not have necessarily the animals on the farm. Uh, so, thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. We're, uh, yeah, we're really proud to be able to do that here in Nova Scotia. Of course, we're, uh, as I said, farmers first and uh, uh, first and foremost. So it's sort of a natural extension for us to what we've been doing here for forever. The vines were sort of um, an addition to that back in 2009. Um, but yeah, thank you for for that. It definitely keeps things interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah, I was, I don't know if now is a great time. I was showing earlier my, uh, I'm a modern shepherd. So one of my passion projects is the, the sheep. So I have here, my uh, barn cameras where we just started lambing season actually uh, today. So our first lamb was born uh, this morning. Oh. And, uh, so I have to keep an eye. My dad is helping to watch the barn this afternoon, but uh, it definitely keeps things, uh, keeps things interesting. Every day is different and the animals definitely add a, an exciting element for sure. And farming has changed in that you've got a camera watching your your lambs, right? <laughs> yeah, That's, exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah. So there are some. Uh, it's funny because biodynamics. Another way I like to explain it sometimes is like a return to the way that we used to farm. Um, like you know, it's the way my great grandmother farmed here. Um, when my father was a child, and that's really why we were attracted to biodynamics. Um, it's just the sort of old school way of going about things and uh but there are now some modern uh some modern uh, technologies enhancements that, that are that yeah, make, yes yeah, that's exactly. right exactly absolutely no, that's great and and so I, again i think i'll build on that michelle unless you'd like to take it another direction but when when we talk about that biodynamics is one of the things we can do as wine drinkers and wine buyers about looking for biodynamic uh certified wines uh, we are we're obviously benefiting the planet in that way. And what are some other things that we can do as as wine buyers? Um... So I'm going to keep with the certification for a second. Uh, yes. We talk about biodynamic, but there's a lot of different ways to farm. Um, and the challenges are not the same in every region. We're talking about Nova Scotia, but for you know, if you're in an area where it rains all the time, um, to be organic is actually may be challenging and it might mean that you have you decide to be organic but as a result you go with your tractor non-stop spraying copper and uh, you know you have CO2 emissions and then you're poisoning the soil with copper use because you're in a climate that is very challenging with lots of rain so I think we have to look there's no magical recipe I think we need to to look at at what works for that vineyard in, in that region. And so there's lots of different certification out there. And I think for consumer, if you look for sustainable certification, biodynamic, uh, biodynamic certification, organic certification, hoping that the producer chose the best method to minimize the impact on the environment, um, it's good because Certification means that you have an audit. You have someone going and knocking on the door and making sure that you're doing what you're saying you're doing. Um, without a certification, you might say you're organic or biodynamic, but you might not be. So I think for consumer, looking for certification is something that's helpful. The other thing is if we talk about mitigating climate change, meaning reducing the carbon footprint, 40% of the carbon footprint of a bottle of wine comes from packaging. So, you know, keeping in mind that 99% of the wines that are purchased are drunk within the first week of purchase. So we really have to relook at the packaging. We're so attached to that bottle of wine and, you know, that bottle of wine with the beautiful cork uh, might be good for the wine that I'm gonna drink in five years from now, but 
there's lots of alternative packaging that you can you can do and Rachel can talk about that because I know they're exploring with lots of different packaging but you know a sparkling wine a single serve sparkling wine in a can fantastic um you know lightweight bottle if you have a sparkling wine bottle you cannot go with a lightweight bottle because you know for the pressure but for a uh, a regular bottle of wine there's no need today to have a kilo a kilogram glass bottle this it doesn't make sense at all so you know if you if you look at your bottle then choose a lightweight bottle don't say no to the heavy bottle it's irresponsible from a producer in 2023 to buy heavy bottle unless it, you know, you have no choice because there's a sort a shortage right now, a glassware shortage because mm -hmm. of the Ukraine war, and that's a reality. Um, then uh, I would say also transportation. Obviously, we're holding an event uh, at Lightfoot, and people who are going to be there in Nova Scotia, what better than buying local wine if you can? for sure you know in the ideal world you have your electric car and you go and you buy your wine from your local producer or bicycle <laughs> bicycle even better right. if you're not too far uh and if you can carry a case of wine on your bicycle um <laughs> but i think drinking local eating local i mean you know at the end i will i will always drink wine from everywhere around the world but i like to encourage local producer it's it's more sustainable and it's also part of why we're doing the event is to to raise awareness on local product when it comes to food but also wine and we we've got a couple of questions now very thoughtful questions but i'd first like to finish up on this packaging piece and then daniel and jean paul will get to your questions here um, and that is that from the wine perspective, from the business perspective of wine, I can tell you that that growers always felt that if it was in a heavier bottle, it had more gravitas, literally, and that it was worth more money and that it was a better wine. And and I think that to your point, Michelle, the, the lack of glass right now is actually helping get rid of that stigma, right, is that people no it, it's it's not the weight of the bottle that tells you how good the juice is inside and i'm sure rachel that you feel the same way as you do your packaging and and actually quite interested to hear about the sparkling in a can that uh, you must be are, are you looking at that now rachel is that what michelle said yeah so um we do have a we do have a product um that is a, a sparkling in a can it's uh we call it bubbly rosé which is uh, we also have a, a 750 milliliter uh, glass bottle version of that. Um, but we're, yeah, cans in Nova Scotia have been, uh, Nova Scotia, our local market is just, we're really lucky. They're very um, fiercely loyal of local products. So we have a very engaged local audience, which is fantastic. You know, historically, we're not really big wine drinkers here. We don't have a big... Um, wine culture that goes back a long ways we're more uh, rum beer drinking uh, culture but very quickly the Nova Scotian um, kind of uh, market has just really um, embraced wine because of our, our local industry and um, they're very open-minded to trying new formats and uh, one of the the things that the the whole region really as a whole has been experimenting with the last a uh, few years is is the can format and we've you know there's a lot of research now that shows that the quality is is just as as good and as Michelle touched on um, cans are uh, recycled more uh, recycled more than than glass bottles and the the carbon footprint is is certainly um, is certainly lower so that that's what really made it uh, attractive to us to experiment with this uh with this format and it's been a it's been a great success the uh the uh tidal bay which is nova scotia's appalachian wine uh it's an aromatic white we actually made the decision uh it was last year to offer our appalachian wine in a can believe it or not so even uh nice. even our signature wine style which i think was quite progressive for nova scotia to yeah. To make that uh, make that decision, and it was with a lot of research, a lot of technical research, and also consumer based research that, um, as a as a region, we collectively um, decided that the qual the qualitative uh, 
level that we need to see for Appalachian wine was there and uh, it's certainly being embraced so it's it's exciting to see you know what could be the next the next format um, down the road to even further lessen that that impact. All right well you can tell from my gray hair I've only just gotten used to screw caps and so now I'm going to start getting used to cans as well. I want to say something about crew cap because yes. it's not okay. good for the environment. Oh, okay. Uh, because crew cap actually takes more energy to, to produce than a cork. Uh, and even though it's recyclable, nobody recycles the screw cap. So it ends up in the, line, the landfill. The cork itself, um, basically, um, every time you harvest the cork of a tree, you increase its capacity to so to uh, to uh, sink carbon by five times, and that cork is biodegradable and recyclable. So uh, if you're given a choice, uh, and a lot of producer actually are going back to cork because it is more sustainable. Isn't that interesting? You're going to have to spend some time down under, Michelle, and convince them of coming back the other way, right? I'm now. working so hard, yes. you have no idea. Oh, that's great. So so I think we should uh, try and get to these questions that are in the chat. So Daniel is asking about uh, greenhouse um, controlled environment for viticulture. And and do either of you, can can you speak to this? I certainly cannot. I'm um, sorry, can you repeat the green? He's asking how far along we are with being able to grow grapes in, in um in greenhouses, which I assume is your question, Daniel. Uh, Are we years or centuries away from that? Do either of you have any experience? Uh, well, they're they're doing that already, and, and like there's uh, there are some experiments uh, and people uh, doing it. I don't know that it's the most sustainable thing to do. Um, I have issues with that, but uh, you know, I always like to say um, there's a reason why we don't have pineapple in Quebec. It's because it's not suited for it. So I That's think. Right. My opinion, I feel very strong about that. We, you know, part of, of being sustainable is growing things that works in your region. And if you have to have eaters underneath the ground, or if you have to do so many things that it's possible, then maybe you're just not growing the right thing. That's right. My, my, my personal opinion. And, and I think that that speaks to, to Jean-Paul's uh, question as well and, and comment where he's in the forestry industry and they actually are planting different types of trees based on climate change and asking if that's happening in the in the wine industry. And I certainly know it is, but I'm sure the two of you know far more than I do about that talk. You know, that I'm thinking something like Niagara's becoming the new Bordeaux because of climate change, right? So they're having to grow different types of grapes, different varietals. Do you want to take that one, Rachel? Or yeah, I definitely know that uh, here in Nova Scotia, there's a lot of research being done uh, between the the province and um, even our local research station here in Kempville. Um, so they're constantly testing different um, varieties for cold hardiness. One of the programs that they have that's very that has a very practical. Um, uh usage for the wineries and the vineyards is a uh, bud hardiness and i know they do that in niagara as well so they'll um they will come out to the vineyards and uh, test the buds and provide us with the level of hardiness that the the varieties are at different parts points in the winter which was very relevant this winter when we had the polar vortex event in february one of the reasons why that has had such a devastating effect on the vineyards here is that the the winter up until that point was quite mild, so we didn't have the hard, the hardiness that uh, we would have we would see in other other years that were maybe a bit colder to start. So um, there's definitely a lot of um, yeah testing being done on on new varieties. I'm not sure if that answers the the question exactly, but um, definitely lots of research um being done i i studied at brock university um and i know there they're constantly um constantly on the topic of of uh, cold hardiness and now climate change is a big big topic that they're very focused on and i think there's you know often when we when this climate change the quick thing is which grape will change but it's a bit more complicated than that you know like the solution to climate change, it's not, oh, we're going to go with this, this grape and everything will be fine. You need to you need to adapt in so many ways. It's like soil management. It's your cover crop. It's the way you're managing your canopy. So it's not just one thing that will solve 
all of the problem. It's a number of different actions at every step that will make you more sustainable. And I think it's why, you know, embracing something like biodynamic, it's like human being, if you're healthier, you're you're more likely to be stronger if a virus comes along. Um, so I think there are a lot of research with grapes and, and rootstocks and, and so on, but I think it's it's adapting a lot of different solutions that will ensure uh, that the producers can can survive and, and adapt and thrive. Yeah, and, and I'm with Philomena that I love uh, Jean-Paul's idea of starting to sell wine and wooden casks again. I think that, so Rachel, there's your challenge. And um, and then Les has a question for Michelle. In a perfect world, uh, what was the what would be the one thing you would want Canadian winemakers to change with respect to global warming? It's a complicated one, but uh, what I would love to see is that every province has their um, has their own unique bottles so that we can resend the the bottle to one place, wash it, and reuse it. Because when we're talking about climate change and knowing that 40% of the carbon footprint comes from a bottle, imagine the best solution of all is actually using a glass bottle and washing it and reusing it multiple times. Um, and if you have a wine industry in your region, and it's been done, it's it's being trialed now in Bordeaux, it's been done in, in Syria, in Austria, where there's a unique bottle for that region. And there's a, a place of deposits so producers and, and restaurants and consumer send those bottles there. The bottles get washed and producer rebuy those bottles for a lot less expensive. It's half the price. And you can kind of reuse those bottles multiple times, but it requires the, the industry to unify because right now, obviously, the bottle is a bit your marketing. Every producer has different bottles. So it would be it would require that you know, in Nova Scotia, in Quebec, and in, in producing region, they agree, okay, we're only going to use one type of white wine uh, bottle, one type of red, one thing of sparkling wine. And then this way, we all buy those bottles together. And then, and then we have a, a cycle that we can reuse them up to eight to 10, ten times. So that's my dream for the wine industry. Uh, it's, it's to have that in place. But it's compli it's very complicated, but it can it, be done it because some wine regions are are doing it. Right. And but I, I, and I have to com commend you on that answer is that to me that that sounds like something that's doable. And uh, when it made me think of the beer industry, which has done that for, for years, hasn't and it? They've, they, but they went back yeah. because it was yeah. for marketing purposes. They but I think in 2023, we have to think of. Actually, I think from a marketing point of view would be very strong. Imagine if the producer in Nova Scotia or Quebec unite together and they say, we're doing this. To me, it's a very powerful marketing tool, even though you're doing it for the right reason, because you're you're empowering the consumer to be part of the solution. And I think in front of climate change, sometimes we feel powerless. We don't know where to start. It's overwhelming. And that's why there's a lot of psychologists who studied that if you feel like you cannot do anything then you have anxiety around the environment and climate change but if you feel that you're part of the solution then it decreases your anxiety and there's a lot of different ways you can do that and um yeah i think it's something that would be uniting and and powerful marketing wise as well great and rachel i, I don't know if you can see the chat but les has given you uh accolades for his he and his wife visited and also on, on your shenan your brilliant shenan which i have yet to try so i'm looking forward to that oh wow <laughs> that's, thank you les yeah. yeah thank you that's um that's a rare one for sure we have just one acre of uh shenan blanc in all of nova scotia so you were wow. uh, so it's not a <laughs> not a common I, uh, brown bottle but uh, thank you for that i'm glad you enjoyed your your visit i'm je jealous less <laughs> so so ladies why don't we talk a bit about uh the this dinner that that's happening on the 22nd tasting climate change in nova scotia it's going to be at uh lightfoot and wolfville uh why don't we talk about what the format of that dinner is and and uh, how that's going to look 
Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. Yeah, you start, wanna, Rachel. <laughs> do you want to uh, do you want to start with sort of your your vision for the dinner? And sure. And then I'll let you take over. Yeah. yeah. Sure. So uh, we first decided to do the event on the Sunday for the wine professional, but like I said, to me it was really important to engage the consumers. So it's going to be a very fun way to engage with some of the actions you can do. So um, the format is I'll do a few words at the beginning just to kind of give a few tips to consumer of what can be done to to um, what you can do to make a purchase that's more sensible for the environment. Um, buying locally is, is obviously number one. And then uh, we chose local wine to go with local food. So at the beginning of each um each uh um i'm thinking in french each uh course course thank you uh, each plan. course uh, we'll have, wait, wait, <laughs> um, each course will have the uh a winemaker uh present the wine and i'll be moderating the event so the idea is and it's earth day so the idea is to enjoy delicious local wine local foods and celebrate Earth Day in good company. And uh, Lightfoot has done an amazing job with, with the menu. Yeah, and yeah. starting with the sparkling, I can only assume, Rachel? There will definitely be some bubbly. Yeah. That we can always promise. Uh, that's a, a guarantee. We must start there for sure. And um, yeah, so we will. Uh, the dinner will actually be located in our barrel cellar, which is uh, quite, um, quite a fun experience. It is a working... Um, barrel cellar, so you'll be surrounded by uh, barrels of of uh, of our currently um, aging vintages, um, and the whole theme, as Michelle touched on, it's it's local. Um, as I mentioned before, there'll be some ingredients from our own farm, so right here on site, and then um, also featuring a few of the local farming partners that we like to to work with um in the in the region and it's always uh, I think so special to have you know different wineries and different producers coming together so I'm really looking forward to to that sort of community aspect and having uh, not just our wines but having some of our our neighbors wines as well um it should be a uh, should be a lot of fun no that's great and and talk about the date and the time and all of those uh that that the interesting facts <laughs> Yeah, so it is um, April uh, 22nd, so that is Earth Day, as Michelle uh, mentioned, and you can find all the details, I believe it's in the chat there now, so there's a, a link that sort of profiles all the information um, about it, and you can get tickets there if you'd like to join us, um, but yeah, April 22nd, it's a Saturday evening. And I've actually put a link in the chat, everybody, if you can, that'll take you directly to a page where you can uh, where you can click for tickets right there, and Michelle, anything else to add to that about the dinner before we? Well, there's another question in the chat as well. No, I just want to say I find that you know it doesn't matter theater, uh, music, dinner. Since the pandemic, people are very last minute in case something's gonna happen. Well, nothing's gonna happen. So <laughs> make sure you book your ticket because a lot of people are coming, um, and I can see the ticket sales um, going. So if you want to come, uh, bring someone. And um, if you don't know the wine, some Lightfoot. I, I just. When, because Rachel can say that, but I'm the outsider, so I can say that when I travel, um, I all, often bring uh, bottles in my suitcase uh, for winemakers from elsewhere to try Canadian wines. And I brought Lightfoot in my suitcase a few times, and uh, I'm I people always think it's champagne. I do it blind. I don't know. I don't tell them what's from, and they often say, "Oh, this is from France." And um, you know, we often look to other countries to see what they're, they're doing and we're impressed, but sometimes we have to celebrate what we have at home. And we have a lot of delicious sparkling wine in Canada, but to me, Lightfoot is one of, definitely one of the best, if not the best that we have. So come and celebrate with us. And um, we have to celebrate the, the, the richness of our own terroir. Marvelous. And we do have another question in, in the chat from Paul about doing the single bottle thing, as he puts it, uh, in Manitoba and Saskatchewan when there's no local um, no local wine production. And, and I get that, and I think I know the answer, but I'll leave it to you, Michelle. I'm not sure that I understand. <laughs> that, that single bottle piece about, about the washing the bottle and that sort of thing, yeah. I think 
in in areas that don't grow grapes it's simply yeah so, correct? so like, yeah so the reason i i answered uh from the wine producing region is because it's something that's the the wine region have the power to do in other provinces it's more complicated it depends where you are as you know every province is different but let's say in quebec it would mean that the saq the monopoly as an example Mm -hmm. have a system the problem is as you know most of the wines are imported when you import wine there's a million type of bottles so the solution is more complicated it would have to be the european union coming with a law that says only three or four bottles are uh, available and then so when they come and they arrive it's all it's we can do a tree we can select and wash right now it's not possible because we import wine from South Africa from a, from all over the world how can you manage that unless we agree that every bottle will be different and we gonna, we don't know what we and and also sorry I'm just there's a lot of complicated things <laughs> because you would need you would need to bottle on site so you would need, mm -hmm. okay, now we have all of those bottles. It means that your producer from Australia would ship the wines in bulk, you know, bottle the wine on site. What do you do with all of those thousands and thousands of bottles that have been imported? It's, it's very difficult to manage. And that's why when I say wine region is because at least they have, they can, there's something that can be done on the regional side, side of things um from from the other side it's it's quite difficult and complicated understood mm -hmm. well thank you so very much ladies we really appreciate your time here today i hope those of you that uh well even if you're not close to nova scotia you could go make it to that dinner unfortunately i can't come that far but uh but michelle and rachel uh best of luck with the conference in uh in uh, april and rachel welcome to the opinion family and uh, we're so glad to have you in our catalog. And I know our we've our initial reaction from the members has been brilliant. So that that's terrific. And thank you, David, for running the board. Thank you, Michael, for setting this up. Really appreciate it. So and and everybody have a super afternoon. And uh, it's the sun is shining here in Kitchener, Waterloo, Ontario. So who <laughs> who, who can complain? Thanks again, everybody. Thanks have everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye bye. Bye.